Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. When we are born, we, we must eat. And we must eat food throughout our lives. Common sense really goes without saying. But when we're born again, born from above, we must eat a different food. And this is why our Lord said, man does not live by bread alone. Let us pray. These are your words, Holy Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. You know, you see it quite often in movies and on television. Some investigator, some researcher has procured a wall in their home or in their office, and upon it they have plastered from floor to the ceiling dozens of newspaper clippings or, or pictures or computer printouts. And then there is this red string. It's always a red string. They pin it in one place and they stretch it out over here and then they pin it over here and they pin it here and pin it there until it touches that and that touches this. And all the various strings lead to one place. This is how we might view our gospel text for this morning. The miraculous feeding is not to be viewed in isolation, nor is it to be merely an example of Christ's power. For what it does is it takes us back to the Passover meal, of what that meal meant and why it was instituted. It's also connected to Psalm 23 of a good shepherd leading his sheep to do what? To lie down in green pastures. The text is very clear. There was much grass there and he told them to sit down. Another red string connects this feeding to when Jesus says that he is the bread of heaven. And yet another string is connected to when he multiplied the oil for Zarephath's reluctant widow. Our, our wall, as it were, is covered with biblical references and stories and allusions and all the strings, all the loose ends. They connect directly, all of them, to our gospel text. I mean, there's a reason why this account is recorded in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, and in John. That is so rare. And though I'd love to look at every one of those connections, it is my joy as well as my burden to only point to just a couple. The first connection is obvious. It's our Old Testament lesson that you heard. You know, like I do, that the ancient Israelites were a bunch of grumblers. Our Old Testament lesson mentions the fact that they were grumblers eight times. You'd think that after being delivered from Egypt, the Israelites would have learned to fear, love, and trust in God. But they didn't. Neither did they trust their pastors, Moses and Aaron. They demand, give us bread and meat, and we'll trust in that. We'll trust in full bellies. And the Lord does so, graciously giving them daily bread with the promise of more tomorrow. It wasn't like going to Sam's and buying like a 15-gallon barrel of mayonnaise. It was daily trusting that the Lord would provide. And so like little birds, they would go out each morning just to gather what God provided. But the command was, live day by day. Let no one leave any of it over till the morning. What? Forget that, Moses. There's no guarantee that this bread will be here tomorrow. It's better to save it. Hoard it. Hold some back. So instead of believing God's word, they gather more. Which rots. Ancient Israelites, they were a tough crowd. They were a stiff-necked people indeed. God disciplined them when they rebelled and forgave them when they repented of their evil. And thus we follow yet our red string from manna 
in the wilderness to Jesus who's been teaching people all day long. Mark is the only one to tell us that to Jesus this gaggle of people were like a sheep without a shepherd. It's not that they were leaderless. I mean, they had an emperor, they had a governor, they had synagogue rulers, even Pharisees, but they had no one to teach them spiritual truth. Jesus was willing, and he would guide them into all truth, showing them the path of eternal salvation. So at the end of the day, the disciples ask Jesus to dismiss the crowd so that they can make their way back into their cities and get something to eat. But Jesus' plan is to feed them, to feed everybody. Not because they were starving or because they couldn't afford it. Food was just a point to something much greater. Even Jesus will say, your forefathers ate bread and died, but he who feeds on this bread, referring to himself, will live forever. Yet before making that spiritual switch, Jesus turns to Philip, asking him, where shall we buy bread so that all of these people can eat? The text even tells us it's a test. It's a test that Philip royally fails. How should Philip have answered Jesus? Well, he should have listened to our Lord, turned and looked at the crowd, or really what he should have done is look at our board that we formulated and followed the red strings, which stretches all the way back to God providing manna in the wilderness. Philip should have said, Jesus, come on, you're God in the flesh. You fed people with manna back then, bread from heaven. I mean, you can make wine from water. You can calm wind and wave. You tell demons to flee. People are healed at your word. So what you did for our forefathers, just do it again. But that's not what Philip said, is it? Nor would we. Philip, as it were, I think I got one. Philip got out his pencil. And he started calculating. Philip would have been a great Lutheran because he's tighter than bark on a tree. So after adding it all up and carry the one, Philip's calculation is, Jesus, bread for all of these people is impossible. Which is not a good thing to say to the Lord Almighty. Overhearing this, Andrew now gives it a shot. Andrew looks at what the Lord has given instead of what to go and buy. He finds the lunch of a Boy Scout who clearly came prepared that day. But in despair, Andrew laments, What are they among so many? Andrew fails too. You know, interestingly enough, way back in the book of Numbers, when God tells Moses that he's going to give the Israelites meat to eat, Moses says, Shall flocks and herds be slaughtered for them and suffice for them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered for them? My point is, in telling you that is, Moses fails the test too. He failed the same, how are we going to feed everyone test? Well, Jesus says nothing to Philip nor to Andrew. My guess is he doesn't even roll his eyes. He would simply provide for what they could not buy, what they could not grow, what they had not earned, what they had not deserved. And as you know, it would be more than they could eat. In that culture, the rabbi actually sits while the people stand. So here Jesus, the good shepherd, invites everyone to lie down, as I say, in green pastures. Our translation says sit, but the text really is lie down. They are to lie down in green pastures and beside still waters where Jesus prepares a table. Instead of calling bread into being out of nothing, he uses means, and that being this lad's lunch. He takes the bread, he gives thanks, he breaks it, and then he doles out to the disciples the food so that they can then 
distribute. The Lord doesn't use angels to distribute the bread. He uses fallible, fallen men. And everyone eats. And as if to underscore the point for the slow of heart to believe, 12 baskets of leftovers are gathered. Can you imagine going to lunch today and saying, I need 12 to-go boxes, please? 12 baskets of food are gathered, one basket for each disciple. Not to eat, but to be reminded of the power of this Jesus. Their cups, as it were, runneth over. Thinking back to our board, we can see how yet another string stretches from this scene straight to Holy Communion. For as I mentioned earlier, in this same chapter, Jesus will expre- explain that He is the living bread that has come down from heaven. That He is the manna in our wilderness wanderings and that He is the bread to fill the sin-starved heart hungry for forgiveness. Beloved, that that body of yours, how do I say this? Things aren't looking real good. Things are wearing out for you. Your lungs your kidneys, your heart. Gravity is taking its toll on you. Your hair is turning gray and it's turning loose. And the truth is, you all are headed to the grave because of the wages of sin. Oh sure, your death certificate's gonna say one thing. It's gonna say cancer. It's gonna say uh, heart failure. The Bible tells us explicitly the wages of sin is death. Your death certificate should say sinner is why he died. Sinner is why she died. The physical life that God has so graciously given and sustains us with daily bread is going to come to an end. No matter how well you take care of it, soon you will pass through this veil of tears. For the time being, though, there's only one way to travel through this wilderness. And it's by way of the heavenly manna Christ bestows which strengthens and sustains you in this life. Because in just a few moments, you're going to receive a tiny morsel of bread. And you're going to receive a little sip of wine. But you are mysteriously receiving the body and the blood of Jesus. And along with that, His promise of salvation and forgiveness and eternal life. His presence with you now and forever. I know it sounds unreasonable. Just as unreasonable as manna falling from heaven. Just as unreasonable as Jesus being born of a virgin. Just as unreasonable as a man rising bodily, physically from the grave after being tortured and buried. Reason is important, but there are times when reason has to be held captive to the Word of God. So beloved, come to the table this morning setting your doubt and your unbelief aside. Come to the table believing the sins which cling to you so tightly fall away in His presence. Rest in the rich green pastures of the church and be fed with a bread that you did not earn and a bread that you cannot buy and a bread that you cannot make yourself. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand together.